Yeah, I've never done a garden tour while trying to hold or talk through a phone. So Carrie mentioned this will be a grounding. We'll, we'll intend for a grounding. Um, anyways, it's really good to see you all. And I've gotten to drop in and out this morning a little bit. Um, Carrie also let me know if the chickens or things are too loud and I could try and go to my headphones. And so we're going to take, um, and if you can time keep for me, because it, it's not letting me see the time as well. Sounds good. We're going to take the next 20 minutes or so. And um, I'm going to start out here with a little bit of context, just sitting here, which is my sit spot where I do my daily meditation and compass practice every day. And then we're going to walk through some of the elements for creating a more resilient edible ecosystem and how that could tie into affecting bigger picture change. We're going to go through things like propagation, water systems, critters, and growing a diversity of plants. Um, look at some creative reuse aspects of structures and then how this could be sort of scaled out at a neighborhood scale or beyond. And in Gaia's Garden, author Toby Hemingway, who is a good friend of ours, passed a couple of years ago, used to teach our permaculture design course, um, you know, talked about this point when you get the right elements in place and the whole garden just goes pop and it's able to sift, sort, and transform every drop of water, every ray of sunshine, every scrap of carbon into this more a thriving, resilient, regenerative ecosystem. And some of those elements are uh, building soil, and cycling and catching and storing water, having a diversity of beneficial plants and critters, greening your structures, and then having more conscious human stewards. Um, so that'll be a little bit of context. Where I am sitting, I'm sitting in the backyard, downtown Petaluma, the Thompson Creek subwatershed of the Petaluma River watershed. And we're about on a seventh of an acre, um, small craftsman house, and I'm just gonna, this is the beautiful grandmother redwood tree that presides over the space that I sit and look at every day as I'm trying to meditate and recenter and make sense of the world. Um, way in the back is the chickens you could probably hear. And so, you know, a couple of the things we're going to touch on uh, is that these ecological gardens can, you know, Carrie mentioned some of the insights from Otto Scharmer and Theory U and this idea of moving from ego to eco and that we live in this disconnected culture and world and through gardening we could actually cultivate a new paradigm for how do we want to be in community and work with nature and because how we garden actually can reflect our worldview and when we see the world as interdependent connected parts and relationships versus um disconnected ones, it, it's, a, it's a massive difference. And you can apply this thinking from the home scale to the neighborhood, to a city, a watershed, and on up from there. Um, and so then, you know, some of our goals in this place are to be able to grow, we call them the eight Fs of food, fuel, fodder, fun, fecundity, feline felicity. We have some kitties, you gotta get them all happy too. Pharmaceuticals and then friends. And then there's um, seven layers in, in permaculture land, the idea of rather than just planting row crops or a monocrop of corn or some other crop, you actually pr plant in mimicking natural systems. And so this idea of uh, mimicking a forest ecology or a food forest. And so you could have your root crop layer, if you picture maybe you're growing burdock root or um, some other root crop, and then a ground cover like thyme because nobody has enough thyme. Then from there you go up to an herbaceous layer. Um, any of your little tasty herbs, I got some right here, some medicinals. This is cleavers right in here next to a volunteer peach tree that just showed up, those beautiful pink blossoms. And you could also see our Chilean guavas and a little nectarine that I just threw a seed in the ground and it just took. So that's a third layer. And then you go up to maybe a mid canopy and that's our Asian pear tree in the distance or the Pakistani black mulberry. You go into your upper canopy, which is that redwood. And then your vining layer, which right next to me is this crazy beautiful jasmine. You can see all these buds about to pop. And we planted that right next to our window so when thousands and thousands of jasmine buds pop, um, it kind of wafts into our house. So those are the seven layers of a food forest. And now we're gonna start out a little bit with propagation. And so 
right here we have some cuttings of tree collared plants and then these are some asparagus or some uh, artichoke plants that I dug up. This is Oregon grapefruit, which is a really powerful root medicinal, a Chilean guava sucker that we dug up. Over here are cuttings. And so what's amazing about grapevines is I just took like 20 cuttings the other day of different grapevines. I think we have six different types of grapes. And each one of those cuttings can become a new plant. So literally right here, we have over a hundred different plants with pretty modest work that I'll be able to give away to people in the coming weeks and months. In this little box, which is with recycled cardboard and recycled straw and soil I dug up in the garden, there's 60 gummy berry cuttings. And gummy berry is this phenomenal bush in the front we'll see that's about to have thousands of ripe little tasty berries. It also fixes nitrogen. So it actually sequesters atmospheric nitrogen into the soil. Um, and so you could grow seeds, you could do cuttings, you could do grafting. This is a really fun little eco geekery. Right here, there's these three little plants and those are roots. I basically dug up a sucker plum plant and I cut off three pieces of root and then I grafted a different variety, um, a scion wood onto each of those. So if they all take that will create three new plants. So you could literally turn one tree into three, five, 10 different trees. Propagation is really phenomenal. Um, so now I'm gonna try and slowly move around, not get any of you seasick. When we moved in, there was only maybe a half a dozen plants on the whole property. And one of them was this plum tree. And it makes these little plums, they're all over the place. Some people call them you know, sucker plums or they have different names, but it'll drop like 50 pounds of plums at once. And they could be pretty tasty, but it's a lot of plums at once. So we cut it back and we put about six different varieties onto that tree. You could see some different colors of foliage. The red one is a Hollywood plum. And so you could have two, three, four, seven different plums ripening at different times on one tree. Then next to it, you know, a plum showed up just on its own. We didn't even plant this, but once the sucker showed up, I was like, huh, let's have a little bit of fun with that. So each of these branches is a different type of plum. And these are ones we just grafted on. You can see there's a little bud popping out. Um, this is a Santa Rosa that I grafted from another tree. For further Willy Wonka eco geekery, this is a little plum arch that we wove. And same thing, a little plum sucker just showed up on the side of the path. I was like, huh, should I cut that? Get rid of it is in the way. And then I dug up another plum sucker and I wove them together at the top. And then now you can see if you go up and down the plum, there's multiple graphs I've done from previous years, but there's also about 10 different ones I added this year. And so through time, if you wanted, you could be able to walk around this tree and do hands-free nibbling. So walk through the plum arch. You could see our cob oven bench on the right, which we dug a hole in the ground and made a nice oven and bench out of it. And my snowboard bench back by the chicken coop. So now we're gonna to touch on water systems briefly. This that I'm panning on is a constructed wetland gray water system. So like mimicking a forest ecology, this mimics a wetland ecology. There's one at the scale of city of Petaluma. Um, there's a wetland treat, uh, wastewater treatment plant. And so this was the first permitted gray water household, household gray water system in Sonoma County. And it enables us to get involved with a coalition that was then a hand, one of a handful of groups that organized people and experts around the state to help shift the California state gray water policy. And we went from doing this one gray water system in our backyard to behind that window right behind it is our laundry system, which is another gray water system. And we installed five in, in one day in our neighborhood by partnering with the city of Petaluma and gray water action. So you can start to go from a backyard solution all the way up to local coalitions to state policy, and then you can bring it down and go to do five in a neighborhood, or we did 13 in two cities the year after that, and then we ran a 100 gray water system challenge. And your gray water is, you know, there's different definitions for it. Black water is toilet water, and black water is also considered sink water now, which we're trying to get to be changed to dark gray water. But it's your laundry water, your bathroom sink, um, your other, your, your tub and shower. So when uh, my baby girl takes a bath, it goes from behind my little stool, that little pipe coming out, it goes through the wetlands, and then it goes out in the garden through a branch drain system.
So this is a rainwater catchment system. It'll, I'll move closer to it in a bit. It's very tall, it's 1,500 gallons. It's the first one we installed. We have five different rainwater catchment systems in different parts of the yard, made up of about 11 barrels, harvesting around 2,500 gallons of water. And that is a massive structure, you'll see when I stand next to it, off of less than half of our roof. One inch of rain on a thousand square foot roof is 600 gallons of water. And so that barrel, as huge as it is, it will fill up in about four or five inches of rain off just half of our roof. So a lot of water falls from the sky and we're anticipated to get a half an inch of rain between Saturday and Sunday. That will add about 150 gallons of water to that, to that giant barrel, the equivalent of three giant um, like wine barrels or something. And so water systems are, you know, and they're really great in a drought and other times to be able to catch and store your rainwater and reuse your gray water. And I may have a garden assistant join me. Hey, Elbel. My daughter, Ella, well, we'll see if she's gonna come back out. I'll, I'll, I'll leave her section. She really wanted to be on the tour. So this is our cob oven and bench. And in the creative reuse and using natural materials, you can see a bunch of sticks laying across the bench. And those are willow from our gray water wetland. And we use them to, um, this is a, what's called a hugaculture bed. This garden bed with potatoes in it uh, is woven from willow and other scrap wood that was lying around. So we use it to weave garden beds. We were using it to, I have broken ribs right now, which is no fun with allergies when you sneeze. But so we've been harvesting the inner bark to make medicine. Uh, willow bark is where aspirin originally comes from, so it's a pain reliever. And then my daughter's been weaving really cool stuff with it as well. And you could also use it for a rooting hormone. A crazy amazing thing about willow is that <clears throat> I was in this place called Hope Valley once in the Eastern Sierras, and I was hiking up at the confluence of two waterfalls, and there were these massive waterfalls hitting, and at the bottom was this little willow pant plant just wiggling and bending and bouncing around in the water and it, it has a really powerful uh, rooting energy in it and so you could actually cut up little pieces and make a rooting hormone so if you want to create propagate and create transplants you could use the rooting hormone I think it's also a really powerful messenger for us in topsy turbulent times of a lot of change that we could root powerfully into the moment even if we're in a raging stream of pandemic and climate crisis and all the rest. About 10 more um, minutes. Okay, thanks. So this is a snowboard bench that I made, recycled materials. We don't have bees right now, but those are our bee boxes. We've had them for about 10 years. Boysenberries, raspberries, recycled materials, chicken coop and fence. My favorite rainwater catchment system, they have their own rainwater system. So the chickens are living large. Recycled materials, shed, um, our neighbor has a cool garden over here, lots more going on. It may be a little tough to see, but this is a little bit of horticulture instead of horticulture. This is four pear trees woven together into a lattice, creating a, a pear fence. All right. All right, so now I was gonna keep it to the outside, but Carrie really wanted me to do a brief little digression to the pantry. So we're gonna do, and we've you know applied a lot of simple creative reuse low cost stuff in the pantries or in the house as well um, so this is our different medicinal tinctures that we've made and here's a whole bunch of honey wine and ciders and different beverages and reused bottles a great way to reuse the bottles this is some of that willow bark medicine some of the oregon grape root these are cuttings of potatoes and carrot tops we're using to grow. Some of the rooting hormone, uh, recycled material using a, a pallet to make, um, make a shelf. And then we have lots of other sort of recycled material shelves and all sorts of stuff going on. We do a lot of creative reuse, um, which saves a ton of money and resources. Right here, you know, toilet paper is a big thing right now. This is mullein which grows in this giant medicinal plant, has really soft leaves, produces tens of thousands of seeds from each plant. And so in case, you know, there is a more permanent toilet paper need, this jar is full of thousands of mullein seeds and we're growing a bunch in here to be able to, they call it cowboy toilet paper. Um, you can see this is the giant rainwater catchment system, that first one. 
Now I'm moving over into the driveway of what could we do with a driveway in a homestead? Right where I'm standing when we bought the house and moved in, there was a Toyota 4Runner sitting here. So I'm standing on the driveway and, um, you know, concrete's difficult to dig up. So we broke some concrete up in parts of the property. Luckily, the driveway was one of those two strip things. So we just buried it. Just walking under um, Sangiovese grapes and an olive tree. This is a cold frame made out of recycled materials. There's a bunch of seedlings in there. It's another great way to create starts or to do season extension. Cherry tree, Nibel grape, more hygge culture beds, asparagus patch. The broccoli plant and purple broccoli. There's two, this is our drive through fast food section. We do have space for one car. And so this apple tree has six different types of apples on it. Each branch is a different apple. And this pear tree has multiple graphs as well. Curbside apple tree curbside almond that we're going under. I was gonna do a little game on it, but I forgot. We have nine different edible arches that you could walk under under different parts of the property. And so up to our front, there are lemons, oranges, tangerines, satsumas, limes, strawberry guavas around the front of the house. That's all citrus. And then one of the good things you could do too with seeds is let plants go to seeds. I let a kale go to seed in this bed last year. And now there's literally hundreds and hundreds of kale seedlings, as well as lettuces and onions and poppies and celery. It's our garlic patch over here, more artichokes. It's that giant gumi berry bush that I had all those cuttings of earlier. And so across the street for another tour, that's the Kavanaugh Center, which in 2009, we installed the first public food forest in Northern California. Had about 150 volunteers come out and since then, we've been installing public edible ecosystems in partnerships with our cities. Next to it is Lori Murray's place that we installed a rocking garden there as well. Then our neighbor, Jesse and Jennifer, daily actors who've done a bunch of gray water and other stuff. And so you could go from one place to start to create a pop throughout the whole system. We lost you for a second, Trayton. No. You still there? Uh oh, which part? Oh, you there we go. Live? I'm here. Here we go. Me? Yep. Um, and we have about five the more minutes. Center part? No, we got that. We have about five more minutes and we've got a few questions coming in. So. Perfect. So we're going to plant in that straw bale. You know, you could use straw bales as benches for parties, and then the next year they get filled in mycelium and you put in the garden. Another pineapple guava edible arch, six recycled olive oil barrels who are linked together into one rainwater system. And then I'm going to go back to where we started the sit spot. And then just to close with a couple thoughts and then we could take Q&A. So hopefully that didn't make you too dizzy and made sense. Um, you know, I'm thinking in the Charmer lens since Carrie shared that resource and just connecting the dots with the emergent leadership focus is that, you know, in this moment of pandemic, we're really sh being shown that our individual and collective actions can affect system change for good or for bad. And we're also all on home lockdown. So it's a powerful time to be growing food, medicine, habitat, beauty, to doing things in your home. Um, you know, we grew 42% of our food in World War II victory gardens. And after Superstorm Sandy, a study showed that neighbor to neighbor cohesion was at the core of resilience. And so starting at that home and neighborhood scale change and moving it up to working with our municipal partners from the city level to the county and beyond is an incredibly powerful way for us to drive change. Um, we're working with the city of Petaluma on their climate emergency action framework and looking at how, what would it look like to scale out these solutions? We've been working with the city for over a decade doing rainwater, gray water gardens, all that stuff, but to really scale it out to be community wide, um, to save energy, save resources, sequester carbon, grow food, medicine, habitat, beauty, you know, could really 
small solutions at scale are incredibly powerful. And it's also really grounding into moving from ego to eco and working coalitions and networks and bigger spaces. If we're taking practical action at home in our lives and we're using it to recenter our compass, um, there's enormous benefits there too. So with that, I'll close it up and would love to hear any questions or thoughts y'all had. Awesome. Well, we do have some questions coming in. So if you have questions, put them in the notes area and I will read them out to Trayton. And we'll take about five minutes for Q&A and then um, we'll break for lunch and Trayton has offered to stay if there's more questions for another 15 minutes or so into the lunch period. So the first question is from Eden. How do you harvest willow bark and what variety is it? Ours is a box willow that was given to us a long time ago. From the reading I've done, you could use a range of varieties. They, I think, virtually all have medicinal qualities at different levels, potentially. potentially. And so there, you'd, you'd want to search around on the internet to find the one that potentially has the highest amount of med medicinal quality. And it depends if you're looking for, like, personal medicine or for rooting hormone or for weaving. Um, but ours, like I, like I said, I've broken ribs and I've been, I've been drinking the tea and it's bitter, but it, it has a pretty significant difference. Um, awesome. And I'll cool, give thank you, you. We have, if you want. It roots really easily. I'd be happy to share. We have it. a ton of willow. We have a creek here. So I'm just oh, wondering yeah, if it needs true. to be a particular kind or if I can just go for it. No, I'd go for it. Try and figure out what kind you have, but I would just go for it and sample with it. Awesome. Felicia wants to know, is everything on drip irrigation, is it connected to the rainwater system? Great question. We have three different drip systems, one for vegetable beds, one for perennials, and one for trees, so we could target the water use accordingly. Not everything is on um, a drip system, and what we usually do is I hand water with all the different rainwater catchment systems so it enables us to turn the drip on later in the system, later in the season. It's also really good emergency water supply. If you have an earthquake or something and water gets shut off to have water in your tank. Um, so, so yeah, it's a really great augmenter. Does that answer your question, Felicia? Is there anything else on that? So to summarize it, it is all on the rainwater catchment. All the water is rainwater. Well, no, no. We have three drip systems mm -hmm. that cover three quarters of our edible plantings in the yard. And we use the rainwater, the drips turned off right now, say. And so using the rainwater on key beds is going to enable us to not turn on the drip for as long. Gotcha. Great. Um, Catherine, with, the, with your experience, uh, Catherine is asking, with your experience, if you are just starting out, what garden elements do you suggest starting with uh, using as anchors? It, it would depend on if you're, you know, in a balcony or a rental, an apartment, a home, do you rent or own? So that would be one set of factors. And then what really lights you up? Like what kind of food or medicine do you like? What colors, what things? So it's, it's a pretty personalized thing. But if you're on a, say a property you own or something, you know, doing, starting with designing your water systems and how earth moves if you need to do any earthwork. So there's some kind of foundational pieces from a design perspective that you'd want to do. But if you're not going that deep, um, so kind of, you know, contextually, it, it really depends on what your situation is. Any other questions for Trethan or thoughts or comments? Thank you for showing us your garden. Yeah, well, hopefully after we're, you know, after we get past all this, we'll have a big pizza party here so you could visit it live and in person. The medicinal side of things is really interesting in particular to me. There's a lot of really cool medicinals. The cleavers I mentioned is medicinal, a lot of different herbs. You know, right now vitamin C is running out in different, um, there's different lung herbs that you could grow in the garden, but you could, we have echinacea in the front and then I take echinacea tincture that I make. Um, you could also buy the herb, but there are a lot of really powerful medicinal herbs that you can grow. Anyone else? All right. Well, as questions pop up um, or inspiration or thoughts, um, maybe Trey, then you can stay on for another 10 minutes or so. Um, 
But with, with that, thank you so much for touring us a heavy dose of what's possible on a relatively small urban scale. Um, and as we take back our lands and convert public lands and um, gorilla open spaces and help renters navigate getting more, more greenery and medicinal herbs and food growing, um, we can do a lot with what we've got. So any last closing words from you, Trayton, before we break for lunch? No, just to, you know, encourage people to dabble again, rent, own, apartment, house, whatever it is. Don't be afraid to get out there and experiment and just have fun with it, you know? Um, I think that's the biggest thing and, and see what lights you up. And I get all kinds of transplants that'll be ready for anybody who wants some as well once they're, you know, once we're out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are right on time. So it's 1230 now. We're going to uh, have 45 minutes for break. So we'll leave the Zoom on. You're welcome to um, hang out together or not. Um, I know Elaine had a quick question on, on Zoom, so we'll do that as well. Break that out for a quick chat um, on Zoom best practices for her students. Um, but then if everyone can come back a few minutes before 1.15, we're going to start at 1.15 um, exploring a little bit more about water systems, waste systems, and, um, and building local resilience. So um, thank you so much, Trayton, and thank you everyone for a good morning. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll re reunite just before 1.15. And, and cool. Oops.